We are really lucky to uh, to march a 40-year career in the military as a navigator, uh, doing sub hunting. Uh, he's done some uh, tours overseas, uh, Europe, Afghanistan. Uh, a little, uh, but, yeah, definitely uh, an accomplished veteran. Uh, uh, seeing some uh, some action, it's really good to have you here. The only thing I'm thinking about is that. If he and I live close together, our wives would be really upset with us because he's into uh, history the same way I'm into history. So anyway, we're really lucky to have Major March. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with five minutes until you heard the presentation. It doesn't work that way. Give me, I'm a walker and a talker. Uh, I learned really on in an Air Force career that if you present a moving target, the audience tends to uh, appreciate what you're doing. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, I'd like to thank the old bold pilots, which I always thought was an oxymoron, but that's okay. Old bold pilots for inviting me down here. It's a great opportunity, and uh, you'll as you'll find from the time I'm complete, I'm extremely proud of my Air Force. I've been in it for almost 41 years now. And uh, 15 months from now, I age out, finally. Uh, so it'll be really, really good. I also want to shout out to Lieutenant General Retired Scott Clements, who was my boss when I became the historian for the first time, way back in the early 90s. Now the bad thing about having a former boss when you're presenting means that all the really great lies I had to tell you, I can't tell you anymore. Because he will point them out to be at great length and it will be a bad major. So, I'm going to talk to you in about 35 minutes and give you 100 years of history of the Royal Canadian Air Force. As you can see from this slide, we've been called many things, some of them not printable, but many things over the years. We started off as the Canadian Aviation Corps, went to the Royal Canadian Naval Air Service, the Canadian Air Force, the Royal Canadian Air Force Air Command, the air element of the Canadian Forces, and now we're finally right back to the Royal Canadian Air Force. But there's one thing, that's been constant throughout that entire time. If you're out there and you're flying and you're fighting and there's a Canadian Rondell on your wingtip, you know that you're gonna get some of the best airmen and airwomen in the world. Because everyone knows you don't want to make Canada. <laughs> but it all started in the First World War, 1914. Now that's Sam Hughes on your left there. Now we all tend to say nasty things about our politicians, and yet it's the politicians, at least in the Western world, that do an awful lot to shape what our Air Forces are. Now Sam Hughes is a man who created the Canadian Aviation Corps. Had one aircraft, the Burgess Dunn, on the right-hand side, and right from the very beginning, we followed the program of Buy America. Because we took 5,000 hard-earned Dominion of Canada dollars, went down to Hammondsport, New York, and bought that lovely piece of technology. Now, I'm not going to say the Americans or you guys put one over on us. However, <laughs> the Burge is done. The Burge is done was not what I would say was a good combat aircraft because it's a float plane, as you can see. So we took it to England to fly in the Western Front in France, and they went, but there's no water there. So it wasn't really a move on our part. But this is what most people, when you're talking to uh, civilians and stuff, this is what most people, oh, I like it in the dark. I look better in the dark, thank you. <laughs> this is what most people think of when they think of the First World War and stuff like this. But fundamentally, that's only a small part of any military training or operation and stuff. This is what we think in Canada when we think of the First World War. This is uh, beautiful downtown Borden, Ontario which in 1917, the British came over because Canada decided not to field the Air Force. The British came over and set up a large training organization. This is called stunting, or as I like to call it, an invitation to death. Uh, that's a JN-4, a Jenny, uh, and the, uh, the pilot is uh, demonstrating to the students their first lesson. But training in Canada always has its benefits. Um, we're don't get as much snow as we used to, but back in 1917-18, I think they spent more time shoveling snow than they actually did flying. So what we decided to do in 17-18 was we went down to Texas. Why? Because we figured Texas would be warmer than Canada. We were wrong. When we got there, it was one of the coldest winters Texas had ever had. And they actually had snow and ice, which was a lot of fun. 
But we ended up down there and we actually ended up training uh, the cadre of the first 10 squadrons for the uh, United States Air Service at that period of time. Also, a uh, little bit of trivia, there's also a Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery just outside of Dallas, Texas, where all of the Canadians that were killed in training were buried. <coughs> and training in the First World War was a very dangerous activity. Uh, over half of our casualties, and Canadians lost over 1,500 people uh, in the First World War, over half of our casualties were training accidents, not combat losses, they were training accidents. But you can't talk about the First World War or the Air Force without talking about the Flyers. Perhaps the best known is uh, Billy Bishop. Uh, he was at one point in time the highest scoring Commonwealth ace. I believe he's been moved down to number two now. But when you talk, when you read about Billy Bishop, you, you understand that it's not the Knights of the Air, this idea of chivalry. Billy Bishop was a well-trained killer. His job was to go out there and kill the enemy, and he made no bones about it. That was his job. <clears throat> Billy Barker is our other Victoria Cross winner. And he was, he was famous for two reasons. I like him because as a flight leader and a flight commander, he never lost a wing. What he did, contrary to what was popular in those days, is when a new pilot or a new aviator arrived in the squadron, he took the time to personally instruct that pilot to give them the best chance they had at surviving. But he was also a constant fighter pilot. A particular quote I have at the bottom is because contrary to orders, he decided to take an aircraft out for one more flip around the front before he was going back to England because he, is, he had been fought out by this point. And he engaged 70, correction, 60 German aircraft, managed to shoot down four of them and survive. And the, the quote at the bottom is the roar from the Canadian Expeditionary Corps when they saw that one particular fight. But everybody has a favorite story. And my favorite story belongs to Alan Arnold McLeod, another Victoria Cross winner from the First World War. And because I'm a big believer in audience participation, why? Because I know for sure there's gonna be two people, or in this case, three people listening to my presentation, me and the two people I pick on. So Caleb, <laughs> and your grandfather, because you're not getting away, can you come up please? Can I get, I don't know how to do this, can I get someone to put the lights back on for just a second? Someone? Button? Anyone? I would push a button, navigators love to push buttons, but I'll screw it up. Yeah, okay. I'll try to Oh no, Caleb, Caleb, Grandfather. What? Caleb's grandfather, come on up. Oh, gosh. Oh, yes. Yep. Stand right here, it's perfect. Look at it, yeah, no. Okay, and yeah, right at this Yes, sir. So we're going to tell the story about Alan Arden McLeod. This is Alan McLeod, and this is his intrepid gunner here, <laughs> Lieutenant Hamlin. So as you can see from this slide, Alan, when he wanted to join the war, he was too young, so the Royal Flying Corps said, bugger off, come back when you're 18. So he's 18 years old now, and we had sent him off to the greatest city in the world, Toronto, in order to get his training. And like any other 18-year-old, his really his thoughts are, I'm homesick, I want to go home, this sucks, people are giving me orders, I have to get a haircut. So no, nothing that we haven't experienced before. But he completed his training, and we sent him off overseas when he was 18 years old. Now he's an intrepid airman. So again, as an intrepid airman, and as a pilot, I might add, his sole consideration was his creature comforts like his underwear. Okay? But eventually this one airman is going to get to the front. He's going to fly something called the Armstrong Whitworth FK-8, affectionately known as the Big Ack. It's a basically it's a two-seater bomber aircraft. So on this particular day in March of 1918, Allen and his gunner are going to go off and they're going to try to find a German aerodrome. They don't find it because they don't have a qualified navigator on board. That's right. That's right. But so they're on their way back home when they spot a German observation aircraft. Allen being Allen decides to attack that German aircraft and positioned it so his gunner, say Lieutenant Hammond, can shoot it down. So that's one German aircraft they've shot down. In the process, they're jumped by seven German fighter airplanes from uh, the Richthofen's Flying Circus. Now, I'm a navigator, my job is to get home alive. So if there were seven of anything coming at me, I would run away, but not out. Now in turn and engage those aircraft. In the ensuing combat, second Lieutenant Hammond manages to shoot down a second German aircraft. But by this time, both Allen and Hammond had 
have been wounded three times. Their aircraft is riddled with bullets. One of the bullets has pierced the gas tank, and gas has flowed down the bottom of the aircraft and caught on fire. And you got to remember, World War I aircraft are fabric and wood. So the bottom is burning, and it's burned out. So Allen climbs out onto the left wing of his aircraft, leans into the cockpit, and continues to fly. Hammond, because Hammond has no place to sit either, straddles the back of the aircraft like a horse and continues to fire his machine gun. By this time, Allen figures it's time to get the heck out of Dodge, so he dives towards friendly lines, being pursued by another German aircraft, which Hammond shoots down. By now, both of our aviators have been wounded five times. They crash in no man's land. No man's land is that little piece of dirt between our side and the other side. And Allen, because Allen's standing on the wing, is thrown clear of the wreckage. Hammond, because he's sitting on the airplane, is trapped in the wreckage. So Allen gets up, staggers back, grabs his gunner, and starts to drag him towards safety. The aircraft blows up because it had a full load of bombs on it, wounding Allen for a sixth time. But he gets up and continues to drag Hammond back. By this, at this point, the German gunners on the ground have woken up. They open fire, wounding Allen for a seventh time. But he manages to get back to trenches, and for this one act alone, Alan Arn McLeod is awarded the Victoria Cross. Thank you. you can but the story does not end there. Second Lieutenant Hammond loses a leg, is decorated for bravery, immigrates to Canada, and goes on to live a long, prosperous life as a farmer in the prairies, and even serves in the Second World War in the Royal Canadian Air Force. Alan takes six months to recover from his wounds, comes back to Canada, catches the flu, and dies four days before the end of the world. <laughs> and in those five pictures, you have the evolution of a World War I fighter pilot. And now on to happier things. Let's talk about the RCF in the end of war period. So, fundamentally, 19, 1st of April 1924, we get to sober cut the nickname Royal. Now we're the Royal Canadian Air Force. We pattern ourselves after our sister organization, our parent organization, the Royal Air Force. Hence why we have that lovely British looking rondelle up in the left hand corner. We are fundamentally an organization that works for the federal government. We, the, the chap that you, if you ever want to take a look at Canada's Billy Mitchell, I think you should look at a, at, a, at a public servant by the name of J.A. Wilson. J.A. Wilson was a very smart cookie for a public servant. What he did is he said, Canada's so small, and we have no threats on our borders, that the only way the Air Force is going to survive is to make ourselves useful to the government. And that's what we did. So when you see the flying boats that we have up there, those were the ones that we used to pioneer things like aerial photography, uh, uh, Spruce budworm spraying, support to the RCP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, became very, very important, if you will, in the interwar period. And that's what helped our Air Force survive during the, during the Great Depression. But we did get a handful of military aircraft, such as the Siskins, and like good Canadians, we took these combat aircraft and immediately made display aircraft of them. And so they went around and they started our tradition of uh, doing air displays that has continued today with the Snowbirds. Now everybody always asks me, why is there a horse in the picture? Well, that horse and the join the team picture go very, very well. Because on the 3rd of September, 1939, when Britain declared war, Canada was, was starting to rearm. We didn't declare war until a week later. But in the meantime, we were going down and saying, where were we going to find all these aircraft that we needed? Because at the start of the war, we had less than 5,000 people in the Air, in the Air Force and 257 aircraft, of which 37 were to be considered modern. So we needed aircraft. So we turned, like we always turn, to the United States and said, hey, can we have some of your aircraft? But in that time, there was a neutrality act. So the United States was forbidden by law to sell aircraft to a belligerent. So we very cleverly looked at the, looked at the wording of the law, and the law says you cannot, you cannot fly and deliver aircraft to a belligerent. So what we, got, what we got the Americans to do was to land on their side of the border, we would hook up teams of horses, we would drag the aircraft across the border, and then we would put a Canadian pilot in. And that was legal. So that's how we did it. William Lyon and Kenzie King. Um, when I first
first started studying human history, he was not a big fan of mine. I was not a big fan of his. But he turned out to be a very brilliant man. He decided right from the outset that Canada's major contribution in the Second World War was going to be the Air Force. And we were going to do that primarily through the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, which by the time it was started in 39 and ended in 45, we produced over 131,000 air crew for the Commonwealth. And so the ubiquitous yellow birds, training birds throughout Canada, we built over 100 airfields, and you can see these triangles when you're flying over, that's an old BC ATP airfield. And of course we did, we did things like we encouraged Americans to come up and join us, much like they had in the First World War. That's a young American getting his wings there from uh, Billy Bishop, actually. And then of course, Hollywood took notice, and we had things like Captains of the Clouds, where James Cagney, for a brief period of time, was actually in the Royal Canadian Air Force. Yes. So over 9,000 Americans came up and joined the Royal Canadian Air Forces. 900 of your countrymen died in the RCF uniform. But, if, again, if you talk to the average person, when they think of the Second World War, they think of the Battle of Britain, they speak of Spitfires and things and stuff, and they probably also think of this. This is perhaps the best well-known poem that talks about aviation. And it talks about the beauty of flight and everything. It was written by John Gillespie McGee, a young American who came up to Canada, went through the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, and joined 412 Squadron. He was killed in a mid-air collision while he was in England. But as you, if you've never seen this, it's a great poem. And I, the, the line, put out my hand and touched the face of God. That just speaks to the beauty and the majesty of flight. <coughs> well, in combat, that's not the way it is. Because most Canadians who served overseas served in Bomber Command, and your odds of surviving a complete tour, 30 missions of Bomber Command, was one in three. So the best poem I can find that talks about Bomber Command is this one. and they washed me out of my turret with a hose. That speaks more to what air combat is like than the other one. The other one speaks of the beauty of flight. This speaks of the reality of sending young men and women to war. And I mentioned 9,000 Americans came up and joined the Royal Canadian Air Force. This is perhaps the most decorated American who came up and joined us. He joined us in 41. They actually called him uh, Big Joe McCarthy because he was 6'6", six, six, big. Big honker. How he ever fit in a Lancaster bomber, I have no idea. He went on after the war to serve in the Royal Canadian Air Force until 1968 when he retired. But he had he was awarded the Distinguished Service Order, the Distinguished Flying Cross twice, and he was actually one of the pilots on the Dam Buster Raid. The war is over. So in 1944, we reached our peak. We had a quarter of a million people in the Royal Canadian Air Force. We were the fourth largest air force in the world. Uh, if you don't count the Germans, then we would have been fit. After the war, by 1946, we had 12,000 people. And then the Cold War started, we started building up. So, McKenzie is, uh, Andrew McKenzie here is, uh, is indicative of uh, one of the airmen who basically served in the Second World War, came back during the Cold War. But he's unique, and I like to tell his story, because he was actually shot down twice. Both times by the Americans. <laughs> Once he was shot down by anti-aircraft fire over Normandy, that wasn't a problem. We fished him out of the drink and he was okay. Second time he was shot down in uh, Korea, and then he got to spend two years as a guest of the Chinese communists. Which I understand is a great weight loss plan, should you care to try it. <laughs> Our two big Cold War activities were basically NORAD and NATO. That beautiful piece of equipment on the left hand side is a Bullmark missile because again most Canadians do not understand that in the 50s and 60s Canada practiced nuclear war. We were quite prepared to use nuclear weapons. We could say we didn't own nuclear weapons because they were American nuclear weapons that you were going to give us if we needed them, but we did practice it. And then the, uh, what I love to call lovingly the lawn dart, the uh, CF-104. When it comes to NORAD, this is fundamentally where thousands of Canadians would have served on the Pine Tree, the Mid-Canada, and New Line. And these are the things you would have done. Such great, uh, lovely places as Montepica. Some of the, if 
if you ever get a chance, some of these old stations and things are really a wonder to see. And when you talk about NATO, this is our golden age. When the F-86, we like to think the Canadian F-86s ruled the skies over Europe throughout the 50s and early 60s. Of course, every other Air Force tells us we were wrong, but they're all lying. <laughs> and we so, and NATO, NATO continues to be a focal point of Canadian defense efforts these days. I love on uh, top upper right corner. It's Canadian camouflage. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And these are the kind of aircraft that you would have seen. Now, after the war, Canada really invested heavily in its aviation industry. So the two, probably the two best known products are the CF-100 Canuck, or Clunk, as we used to call it, and then the CF-105 Arrow. I put the arrow here, there's somebody out there with a shirt that has the arrow in the background. This, every Air Force has a mythical aircraft. This is our mythical aircraft, right? They have made all sorts of things. We built five of these things, working on the sixth, when the government of the day decided to cancel the program. Why did they decide to cancel the program? Well, it would have eaten up over half of our defense budget for this one aircraft. So they said it was basically affordable. On that very day they canceled the contract, the owner of Avro Canada fired his entire workforce, 56,000 Canadians out of work in one day. So it is, it is, it is attained a mythical status. Apparently there's an arrow hidden in a barn somewhere in Palm Springs. If you find it, <laughs> let me know. But, Strangely enough, the two most successful aircraft programs we had were actually the two aircraft at the bottom. These are aircraft that we actually, one's an otter and the other one's a caribou. And these are aircraft that we sold to the US Army and they became um, key to some of their efforts in Vietnam because of their short takeoff and landing things. So we have the myth and we have the reality and in the middle we have the Avro car. Our gift to flying saucer busts everywhere. <laughs> We built two of those, and I think there's one in the Smithsonian. But we didn't just do NORAD, and we didn't just do NATO, we did peacekeeping as well, too. So again, because we have these, we had lots of these little aircraft and stuff like this, they became very useful in peacekeeping mission. Bottom left-hand corner is what a buffalo looks like after it's been hit by a Syrian surface-to-air missile. Up until, uh, up until, well, actually, no, actually forever, that was our most serious loss, combat loss, or loss, if you will, after the end of the Second World War. <coughs> Humanitarian, also a big thing. Uh, upper left-hand corner is food to Russia, or the former Soviet Union. Bottom left is air traffic controllers in Rwanda, which is another garden spot of the world. In fact, I think the Canadian government would save lots of money if they just stopped issuing us clothing to wear in Canada, an issue that's nothing but sandy covered clothing or clothing to use in tropical because we can't stand to spend so much time in most parts of the world. And then of course we have the disaster assistance response team which is to go out and help when there's a major disaster. Combat, uh, we don't call it war anymore because war takes a physical act of uh, our government so we, we just go into combat. Right. So this is uh, CF-18s during the first Gulf War which is the first time we, produce, we uh, participate in active combat since, since Korea. But we didn't just do combat things. This is probably today the most well-known Canadian Air Force officer, even though most people don't know he's a Canadian Air Force officer. That's Colonel Retired Chris Hatfield, um, our astronaut, our singer who loves to sing uh, ground control to Major Tom, I believe, in the ISS and stuff. When I used to get drunk with him in school, I had no idea this was what he was going to turn out to be. Yeah. <laughs> and like everybody else, we went into Afghanistan as well too. 56 Canadians were killed when the Twin Towers came down. So we were keen on participating in the war against terror in Afghanistan. It's a lovely part of the world if you've never been there. I highly recommend a visit on a tour season. That's the uh, compound in Kandahar uh, during a uh, sandstorm. So our first sojourner over there as a Canadian Air Force, we used the mighty Spare Bear. The Spare Bear is a German-French unmanned air vehicle. It is launched with the same technology we use to throw rocks at castles. Right? We use a catapult. That's right. 
For a while, it was the most expensive aircraft the Canadian Air Force ever flew because it was never designed to work in, in atmosphere and altitudes in Afghanistan, and we pranked, crashed a lot of them. So it, for a while, it was the most expensive one. Now, anybody who's ever dealt with flight safety understands that every time we crash an aircraft, we have to do a flight safety report. There is still one of these aircraft that we have an uncomplete report on because by the time we got out to where it crashed, the local people had taken it away, so we have no idea where that particular aircraft is. But it reintroduced us to nose art. Nose art is that particular way where the air crew, the uh, young men and women, have a chance to express their individuality on the aircraft. All these things. Except unlike the Second World War, we actually stood up a committee to examine every piece of nose art to make sure it met all of the current requirements for nose art. So you won't see any scantily clad women or things. In fact, the spy versus spy picture you're probably violating copyright, but shh. Strategic airlift, the Air Force was heavily involved. In fact, out of Trenton, where I'm stationed, if it's happening in the world and Canada is involved, then the people, the men and women in Trenton are involved. What you see on the right-hand side is the picture of what it's like with a full load of troops in the back of a C-17. Why, or oh why, when you're carrying that many troops, have they only designed one washroom in the C-17? <laughs> because you haven't lived till you've done a 14-hour trip with 186 well-fed soldiers with one bathroom. <laughs> Tactical airlift. The, uh, the stuff that's being dropped out of the back of that uh, C-130 is actually something called a Sherpa, which is a really cool, neat piece of kit. We get tired of patching bullet holes in our aircraft. So we invested in technology whereby you can push this stuff out of the back at 10,000 feet, and it's a big pallet with a steerable parachute, and you can actually steer it by remote control. So you drop it, and you can put it in the floor. <coughs> then the mighty Chinook. Back in the mid-90s, Canada decided to get out of the Chinook business. We were losing too many troops in Afghanistan, so we got back into the Chinook business. We leased or rented five used Chinooks from the United States Marine Corps, and we put them to good use in Afghanistan. You've heard of whiteouts with snow? These are browners when you're coming in. Tactical es escort with the Griffins. If you've ever seen the top left-hand corner, if you've ever seen one of the miniguns in action, you do not want to be on the ground. Unbelievable weapon. And then finally, the ubiquitous UAVs, unmanned air vehicles. The spare bear went its course and we picked up the Heron, which is the picture on the right. The Heron is an Israeli product. We did not quite take into account the difficulties in buying parts from Israel and trying to ship them to a Muslim country. So we could not get parts direct from Israel into Afghanistan. We had to buy the parts, ship the parts to Canada, repackage them and ship them from Canada to Afghanistan. So it complicated our replacement part issue. Just a tad. Greatest weapon we have, Timmy's. Uh, for those of you who have never frequented Tim Hortons, uh, Canada is addicted to its coffee. And one of the uh, pushers of our addiction is Tim Hortons. This is our way of taking over the world, I swear. The only difference between a Tim Hortons in Afghanistan and Tim Hortons in Canada is the patrons in Tim Hortons were better armed. And this, believe it or not, is one of the best tools we ever had in Afghanistan for securing cooperation amongst our allies. Anytime we needed to get something from the Americans or something from the Brits, we would go over with our pockets full of these Tim Hortons coffee carts. And we would tack and we'd chat and, oh, here, here's, here's enough for 10 cups of coffee, free coffee. They would say, oh, and, and then we'd come back, do you need an airstrike? No, yeah, well, okay, that's how we do it. And I'm being facetious here, but this is actually true. You can never put a price on personal connection when you're in a military operation. And anything you have, such as a Timmy start, to facilitate that is gold. And we also took our first losses in Afghanistan. Uh, due to accident and due to, uh, due to enemy fire. Upper left is what's left of a Chinook when it's hit by an RPG. Fortunately, everybody survived that one. Uh, one on the bottom right was basically uh, uh, one of our helicopters taking off. It got disoriented in a brownout and it flipped the rotor and stuff. 
Now, the upper left-hand corner, as I was telling some, some friends of ours last night, I had the opportunity to interview uh, Captain Bell, who was a young pilot who was flying that particular thing. And as a historian, one of my privileges is to talk to vets. But when you talk to vets and you talk about their experiences, you, you have to watch. You have to listen with your eyes as well as your ears. When I was talking to Captain Bell, they were coming into a forward operating base. They got hit by an RPG in the back. Big explosion. Everybody's screaming in the back. The aircraft's on fire. When you're talking to him, he is calm, cool, professional. He's a well-trained aviator. He talked to me and he told me how he put that aircraft on the ground. He made sure everybody get out. And everything was great. It was a, it was a sterling interview. They get out of the aircraft. Now they're still taking small arms fire. Now you've got a well-trained aviator who's not in his element anymore. And you can see it in his eyes. You can hear it in his voice. Now he's, he's gone from being in control to being, oh God, what do I do now? And fortunately, there were a whole bunch of Army guys that we were head in the back, and they took over at that point in time. But it's an interesting dichotomy when you go from something you're in control of to something you're just along for the ride. And of course, this was part of our Air Force role too. 159 Canadians were killed. Just under 2,000 were wounded, and the Air Force was responsible for bringing them all home. And each and every one um, each and every one took the same ride and got the same treatment from Canadians. But the combat didn't stop in Iraq. The correction did stop in Afghanistan. We got to go to Al Mobile in Syria, the correction in uh, Lebanon, or in Libya, and now we're in Iraq and Syria. Again, the pictures don't change, only the people get younger, I find, and stuff like this. And still our main combat aircraft. Getting like looking looking like a lot of us. Getting kind of old now, the CF-18. What uh, what's in the future for that particular beastie? We have no idea. It's, but it's a it's a very capable, very good aircraft. What does the future hold? I I don't know. Okay, we have new aircraft we have to integrate, such as the uh, Cyclone in the upper right. We've got a new search and rescue aircraft. We, Going to integrate the Chinooks, more UAVs, the C-130J, and a replacement for the CF-18. But at the end of the day, this is what it's all about. We're good at what we do. We're well trained. We're capable. We will press it if we have to. But at the end of the day, we want to make sure that everybody comes home if we can. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? If I don't know the answer, I will lie. Yeah. I had the opportunity to uh, fly in an air show down Peach Tree or Peach Avenue or whatever in, in Atlanta. And uh, we were drinking with some, can I call you a Canuck? Canuck? Canuck, yeah. I, no, Canadians don't drink. Oh, okay. It's <laughs> 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 <Anyway>. constitution, man. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we, yeah, and uh, we were abiding. And, uh, and uh, I looked over at one of the Canadians and uh, and I said, well, uh, why do you wear your wings upside down on your on your uniform? And he says, that's, he says, so we can tell whether we're flying inverted or not. <laughs> but the other the other thing is, is it a myth or not that your great grandfather was named after, or that March Air Force Base was named after your great grandfather? Is that? <laughs> My great grandfather was a yes was a, a sapper in the First World War, so I doubt very much. And my father was a chief petty officer in the Second World War, who interestingly enough uh, deserted when he first joined and spent 10 weeks in the, uh, in, the uh, in prison, which he never told me. I had to 
find his record after he passed away and went, oh, well, that explains a whole lot. I didn't know that. <laughs> Any other questions? Great job. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>